I've read your extraordinary and unusual story. And first of all, it's an honor and a privilege to speak with someone who survived uh, the conditions that you had to survive in. Where, do you, where would you like to start in the story? Well, I could start uh, back with my family background. My family did come from Germany. They had lived there for many, many generations, eight to 10. And they grew up uh, during the Weimar Republic in a town in southern Germany called Mainz, which, by the way, is where Gutenberg invented the printing press. It's still there today. So it was very historical. My father had lost a brother in World War I. <clears throat> so my, his mother, my grandmother, had the Iron Cross. And when the Nuremberg Laws were passed in 1935, uh, they were in the textile business, so their business was taken away. And, uh, you know, Hitler started slowly. He first took businesses away, and then Jews weren't allowed to be anywhere in public. My parents had just gotten married and realized that this madman, who they thought would never prevail in a country like Germany, which was supposed to be and still is so civilized, um, they realized that, yes, this madman is going to prevail, so we're going to apply to go to the United States, which is a country of choice when you persecute it, I think, to this day. It was very, very hard in the 30s to enter this country. The State Department was extremely anti-Semitic, and the quotas were very, very low. So they decided to go to Palestine. They did have that possibility. I say Palestine because we're talking about the 30s, which is now Israel, and Israel became a state in 1948. So I was actually born in Palestine, which means in Hebrew that I am a sabra. It's the fruit of the cactus. It is sweet on the inside and prickly on the outside. <laughs> but. I was one of a twin. My twin didn't survive because they didn't have incubators. So uh, my mother was very distraught. And the uncle, my father did have an uncle in New York who was willing to support them financially, which was one of the conditions to enter this country. And he went to the State Department and uh, he wrote to my parents, if you make your way to France, maybe a ship will leave from Le Havre for New York. The ships are still leaving. We're talking before the war. So my mother had a brother living in France, in Paris. And so they were able to make their way to Paris, hoping to catch a ship to come to the United States. And then World War II broke out. I don't remember these early years. I was literally just a toddler. But uh, what happened was, and I'm talking of 1939. The war broke out September 1st of 1939. The next day, England and France declared war on Germany. And the French decided at that point that the enemies of France, which included Germans who were on their soil, Italians, who had fled Mussolini, Spaniards who had fled Franco, who was also a dictator, uh, would be sent to refugee camp. And uh, because they considered, even though they had fled, you know, very uh, fascist regimes, they still felt that maybe they would be a danger to the country. So we were sent to literally a stadium. It was called Colombe, a sports stadium. There was no hygiene, there was no roof, there was very little food. But in that camp, the French realized that they had some very strong men and they were poorly prepared against Hitler's military might. And so they gave those men the choice of joining the French Foreign Legion, which is an army made up of foreigners, and they would release the women and the children. So my father enlisted in the Foreign Legion, was sent to Africa for training, and my mother and I joined my French aunt, and they started to make their way south. So in order to survive, you needed a lot of luck. Because in 1940, in June of 1940, literally seven months after the war started, France surrendered, and a man by the name Philippe Pétain signed a treaty with Hitler promising to fully collaborate with him, including the anti-Jewish laws. So all Jews in France 
were then forced to wear the yellow star. Uh, they were given ID cards with the letter J stamped on it so that they could be identified very easily. And so my father was released from the army because for all practical purposes there was an amnestice. So we were reunited in the town of Toulouse, which is a larger city in southern France. And there my father decided that we were not going to wear a yellow star and we were going to take on false identities. And as a young child, I was told my name is Ruth. In France, it's considered a Jewish name. It's from the Old Testament. I had an older cousin, Jeanette, who told me, from now on, your name is Rene, therefore the title of my memoir. Don't tell anyone where you live. Don't tell anyone that you're Jewish. I said, what's that? I had no idea. She said, this is wartime. These are very dangerous times. You have to abide by what I tell you or we could all be arrested. She didn't say killed because people didn't know. On those days when it was safe, I would go to school, but they were few and far between. My father heard about a man working at City Hall who was giving out false ID. In a way, he was a silent resistor because he had an authentic ID card writing down false information without the letter J on it. And that's how my parents were able to get false IDs. This man who worked at City Hall was able to warn my parents one day. He came running to the room that we occupied and told my parents, there's gonna be a big roundup of Jews tomorrow and you're on the list of people to be arrested. Run to the station as fast as you can. I think there's one train leaving tonight. If you don't make that, I can't guarantee your safety. But my father said, I have a brother living nearby, you know, my cousin Jeanette's parents. Uh, I'd like to warn him, he said, well, tell me where he lives, where they live, and I'll warn them, but you better run as fast as you can to the station. So we ran to the station, there were thousands of people there. My uncle and his family never made it. And we only found out at the end of the war that he was arrested that day and ended up uh, perishing in Auschwitz. His wife was arrested later on and she died in Bergen-Belsen. My cousin Jeanette, who was young and agile, was able to uh, climb on the roof or run as fast as she could. So when she was left an orphan, some uh, classmates took her in, but we didn't know that. So the train stopped in the middle of nowhere. It was a rural part of France, and we were directed to a farm, and the next there were thousands of people around. And the next day we were directed to a village, the village of Artez, where we were given a room. And my parents by then had no money left. So the people who lived above us were the Fédou family. My father found out that Monsieur Fédou was in the resistance. And little by little, he began trusting the family. And Mr. Fédou said, are you Jewish by any chance? And my father said, yes, and we're in very grave danger. So he said, the family who occupied the room that you're occupying now was Jewish. And one day a truck pulled up hauled them away and we never saw them again. So we promised ourselves that if ever there would be another Jewish family, we would try to help them as best we can. There was a one room schoolhouse in the village, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade in one room with one teacher. The girl on my right was a second grader. She was very nice to me. She could tell I didn't have much to eat. She would share a sandwich with me and she said, you know, I know a lady at the edge of the village who has a vegetable garden. Why don't you go see her? Maybe she'll give you some food. So Lucette, the Fédou, the oldest daughter of the Fédou family, gave me her doll. That was the only toy I had during the war. I saved it and it's now at the Hammock Museum. And the day I went to see this lady who had the vegetable garden, I had my doll with me. She said, okay, I'll give you some food. She gave me some bread, she gave me some cheese. She gave me a cauliflower, said, what's that? Oh, your mother will know what to do with it. And then on her windowsill, she had some bottles of wine because people there, it's in Southern France, had little vineyards. And I must have overheard my father say to my mother, 
on a Friday night what I wouldn't give for a glass of wine, you know, because in Jewish tradition you say a prayer over wine, you light candles and sip. And this little girl, me, had the nerve to tell her, and my father likes wine. <laughs> And she said, okay, I'll give you a bottle, but be very, very careful because if you trip and it breaks, we made this drink before the war. We, we're not making wine right now, but you're so cute, I'll give you a bottle. Oh, thank you, madame. And in exchange, I said, here's my doll, Janine. I had given her a name. She said, no, 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 put your doll on top of the bottle of wine. This way, no one will see that you're even carrying it home. So when I arrived home, my mother was very worried because I was late. And she saw me with all this stuff. She said, where did you get it? Did you steal it? I said, no, no, this lady gave it to me. Okay, they probably need it as much as we can. Why don't we go back and return it? And that's how my mother met Madame Jeanne, Jeanne Vallard, who said to her, if my husband and I can ever do anything for you, please let us know. Well, two weeks after that episode, two policemen came to the door. Just to give you an idea of my size, I was at eye level with the buckle of their belt. And they said, where's your father? And I said, I haven't seen him in a thousand years and you're not gonna find him. They took me to the window and they said, last time you saw him, which way did he go? I have no idea what made me do it, but I pointed in two different directions. Well, by then I was hysterical and I could hear one say to the other, shall we take her? At the beginning, and in that area, they took mostly men. Then later, they took the whole family. But if the, they couldn't catch a man, they would take who, whatever member of the family they could, knowing that the rest of them would follow. So I could hear the others say, let's wait and see what the rest of the day will bring. I found out maybe 20 years later, maybe even 30, that this other policeman had a little girl my age with dark curly hair and didn't have the heart to take me. Anyone who was taken that day did not survive. So I owe my life for looking like this policeman's little girl. So my mother was hysterical when she saw that I was being interrogated by the police. Madame Fidou said, let little Renee handle it. If uh, she leaves with them, you can always join her. So uh, she saw them leave without me and decided that we couldn't stay there one more minute. They could come back literally any second. The Fedus did not have a, a basement, but the Valas had a little farm where I begged for food. So she ran over and said, they came for my husband today. Could we spend the night in your basement? And they immediately said yes. Remember, we were total strangers to these people. And the days turned into weeks, that turned into months. Things became more and more dangerous. The Valas kept us in their basement. They actually built a wall parallel to their own wall, so it wouldn't look like anyone would live there if police came. And they may have come, I don't know. But after a while, I could see my mother pack the few things that I had. She had unraveled a sweater to make me a sweater. She had made a dress out of one of her skirts. I said, where am I going? She said, well, you look, you're so pale. Um, this lady is gonna pick you up and she'll take you for a ride in the countryside because, and then you'll come back. And that's really all I knew. So this car pulled up, it was Madame Khan and her two children, Amy and Jean-Claude, and uh, she said, hop in. So we drove and drove and drove and we arrived at this big foreboding building. She left us across the street and it had very high windows, I remember. And I thought they were stained glass, but they actually were painted blue. So you couldn't look in from the outside and you couldn't look out from the inside. It's actually not in the book. I found that out later. And this lady came out dressed in black. And I said, this is absolutely the strangest lady I've ever seen. Long veil, long dress, black shoes. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, who is she? Well, I didn't know she was Mother Superior. This was a convent, an orphanage. And Madame Khan introduces her children. This is my son, Jean-Claude. This is my daughter, Emmy. Turns to me and says, this is my other daughter. I remember thinking, she's not my mother. 
what happened to my mother or my parents, but I was sworn to silence, so I didn't say anything. She took us in, introduced us to the nuns. But one day she came running to the cafeteria, gathered seven of us, and said in French, suivez-moi, which means follow me. She took us to the chapel. There was a trap door in the chapel and said, descendez, go down there. And we could hear the conversation going on above our heads. One male voice speaking German, one male voice speaking French, we understand that you're hiding Jewish children. She said, me hide Jewish children? Why would I do such a dangerous thing? Well, you can imagine how we felt. Had they had dogs, they would have found us. But then we heard them walk away. She left us down there for another night or so. June 6 rolled around when the Allies landed in Normandy under the high command of Dwight D. Eisenhower, of course, mostly Americans. And by the way, tomorrow will be the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. I owe my life to these soldiers. There was a second landing in the south of France and we were liberated the same day by coincidence that Paris was liberated, August 25th, 1944. When I was liberated, so were my parents and we were reunited. I was extremely lucky that they had survived. My father worked as a farmhand high up in the mountain that you can only reach on horseback or donkey back or on foot. And my mother stayed with the Vala in their basement. And one day Madame Vala said, oh, why don't you come to church with me? I'll just say that you're a cousin from a nearby town. We stayed two more years in the village, then made our way back to Paris. And the Red Cross paid us a visit and that's when my father found out that he has lost his entire family. Everyone who had stayed in Germany was deported and murdered. So he totally fell apart and never, never wanted to talk to me about the war years. My mother, by some miracle, saved the family album. So when I asked questions, she would show me pictures of family members that I would never get to meet from the family album. My father lost his two sisters, the brother in France, a nephew whom he adored, and many cousins, aunts, and uncles. And my mother's parents were sent to Terezin, which was a concentration camp, which is now in the Czech Republic. They were liberated because the Red Cross paid one visit to one camp, and that was the one. So they were exchanged against German wounded soldiers. I did get to know my maternal grandparents. My grandfather died six months after he was liberated, but my grandmother did recover, so I did get to know my, my maternal grandmother. How did you get to America? My best friend in Paris wanted me to meet these two Americans while we were students, and I said, during exam period, I said, you know, you can go, but ask somebody else. I, my exams are so hard, and I especially in organic chemistry, which is very difficult. Well, she couldn't find anybody else, and she said, uh, you know, all you have to do is, you have to have dinner, Let, let's go out for dinner. These are friends that I met in England during the war, etc. So uh, when I found out that one of the gentlemen was a chemical engineer, I said, do you know anything about organic chemistry? He said, what do you want to know? Well, it was methane, butane. He wrote down all the formulas much better than my professor explained to me. So I tore off the paper and I passed my exam. The following year, when I passed all my exams, as a gift, my parents gave me passage on a ship to the United States because my parents had a family in New York. So, of course, I looked him up and we fell in love and we married. <laughs> what I want to ask you is, about anti-Semitism then and anti-Semitism now? Well, I think um, anti-Semitism will always be with us. We have to be vigilant and it's getting, it's rearing its ugly head again. And when you have states like in Texas who say, if you teach the Holocaust, you also have to show the other side, which other side? You know the old saying, if, if you don't teach history correctly, it is bound to repeat itself. 
and I'm afraid it is repeating itself. It's very upsetting to me. I never thought that one day I would be faced again with anti-Semitism, and it's all over. How did you handle anti-Semitism as a child? Strangely enough, I knew nothing about Judaism except, in fact, it's in the book. If, if they arrest all the Jews, why be Jewish? You know, what does that mean? What is it? I didn't even know. I never felt it after we were liberated, I'm talking. I never felt that in the village people were really anti-Semitic. Life, they tried to resume their, their normal life, which was very difficult. But back in Paris, when I went to elementary school, I was still a young child, you know, we seemed to seek out the other Jewish children. Many had lost their parents, or at least one parent, and we were called dirty Jews by the other children because they get it from home. I belonged to a scout troop that was Jewish, and uh, I just kept my name Rene, even at the Sorbonne, at the university, because some professors had been collaborators, and it was known. So I only felt comfortable with my name Ruth when I arrived in this country. And, but the country has changed a lot since then. What message would you like to leave with future generations? Well, it's very, very difficult with the social media where there are so many lies out there to get to the truth. But I would say get to the truth as best you can. If not, history is bound to repeat itself. And there are a lot of lies out there. And uh, there are sources and there are many organizations that do tell the truth. If uh, you're being insulted, whether you're Jewish or not, you know, there is the Anti-Defamation League. It's well organized. There's a American Jewish committee that do fight anti-Semitism all over the world. I noticed the pin you have on. This says Zakor, which in Hebrew means remember. A million and a half children were murdered in the Holocaust. It's an unfathomable number. And the Holocaust in general was the most horrific event in human history. And it only happened 80 years ago. Why? Why did people follow blindly a madman like Hitler, who spewed lie after lie. You don't have to be Jewish to speak up for all those people who were so horrifically murdered just because they were either Jewish or gay or socialists or labor unionists. It could happen again. That's what scares me. Hi, my name is Chuck Feldman, and I am privileged to be the president of the Holocaust Awareness Museum and Education Center, also known as Hammock. Our organization and our museum was founded by the late Yaakov Riz and his wife, Sheila Riz. Their founding of the museum in 1961, we became the first Holocaust Museum in America that was open to the public. Yaakov was born in Poland and at the age of 15 had the opportunity of being in the streets of Lutsk, Poland and heard Zev Jabotinsky who was warning the Jews about the fact that the Nazis were about to invade. Yaakov went home, told his parents that they had to leave. They looked at him and said, why? You heard somebody in the street talking? And besides, where would we go? After a while, Yaakov, who was a teenager, decided he would leave his family. He went into the Soviet Union. He joined the Red Army. But when they found out he was Jewish, they arrested him and put him into the Gulag in Siberia. While he was a captive there, he made a promise to God. That promise was that if he survived, he would tell the whole world and especially young people 
about the Holocaust. Well, he did survive. And after the war, when he was released from the camp, he made it back to his home only to find that all 83 of his relatives had been murdered. He went to what was then Palestine, fought in Israel's War of Independence, and subsequently met his wife, Sheila Riz. They got married, they came to America, and moved to the Oxford Circle section of Northeast Philadelphia. And a few years later, in 1961, Yaakov fulfilled his promise to God. Our heroes, our survivors, have spoken to over 200,000 young people in the state of Pennsylvania alone. Please, if you have any contact with any schools, please contact us. Hate never takes a vacation, so neither can we.